In this particular case, I want to talk about the restoration of the habeas corpus writ to Ontario uh, courts in particular. Um, so I am writing a series of articles on one case. I'm focusing on the case as part of my larger project, which is to bring a variety of methodological tools to try to make sense of something that actually makes no sense at all, and that is immigration detention. Um, so although I might guess that most people here are familiar with the idea of detention, a quick introduction would be that it is a form of warrant-free incarceration for immigration or refugee-related reasons. There is no standard or legal definition of detention, but the three primary grounds for which someone can be, delayed, can be detained in Canada are for identity reasons. So if, they, if the Canada Border Services Agency offers or things that the person before them is not the person in their passport. Um, the second ground is criminality. So if the person um, seems to present a threat to herself or others or has a criminal history or a likelihood of committing crime, then that can be seen as a ground for detaining them. And then finally, for flight risk, so likelihood of absconding. Uh, there are no time limits on detention in Canada. On, although it is meant to be a pre-deportation measure sort of at the end of the day. But there are monthly bail review hearings. Detention is legally meant to be non-punitive non-arbitrary, and always a measure of last resort. In terms of the numbers, between 2012 and 2017, the Canada Border Services Agency detained an average of 7,215 people for immigration-related reasons each year. Uh, these numbers do not include children who are detained as the guests of their parents and do not turn up usually in the statistical record. In the fiscal year 2016-2017, the CBSA reports detaining 6,251 people for a total of 131,617 detention days. That's not my terminology, that's theirs, with an average of 19 and a half days spent incarcerated in either one of the three immigration holding centers or in any number of provincial correctional centers. 439 people were detained during this period for over 90 days. Again, warrantless incarceration, not for criminal reasons. It looks like criminal incarceration, but it's not. But the case here that I want to discuss is called Scotland versus Canada, and it was decided a few months ago in the Ontario Superior Court. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, so in some ways, Scotland, the case, focuses on the legality of release in a system of indefinite incarceration, again, with no upper time limits, and then on habeas corpus as an instrument of justice, which is how I interpreted the theme. <laughs> uh, so as I'll explain, the writ of habeas corpus was restored to the immigration detention sphere only in 2015, and then only in Ontario. And Scotland, the case, is one of the first cases of a detainee successfully applying for a writ of habeas and then release from detention since his restoration. So let me tell you a little bit about the case. You may be wondering why it's fascinated me enough to write two whole articles. <laughs> so the applicant is named Ricardo Scotland. He is a 38-year-old Barbadian who filed a December 2010 refugee claim in Canada. He is a single parent to a 13-year-old daughter. He has no criminal record in either Canada or Barbados. Yet, due to the Immigration Division of the Immigration and Refugee Board, which was part of the chart that we saw in the first presentation, um, due to the Immigration Division committing a series of errors and misjudgments, Mr. Scotland's arrest for a firearms charge that the Crown eventually stayed stretched to 17 months of incarceration at the Maximum Security Niagara Detention Center, 
which is run by the Ontario Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services, not by the CBSA. The judge, uh, Justice Ed Morgan, who ordered his release, characterizes Mr. Scotland's incarceration as an anomalous occurrence outside the regular state of play. For instance, he uses florid language to describe the incarceration, such as Kafka-esque, after the novels of Franz Kafka, without, quote, rationale, reminiscent of a catch-22 situation, and therefore worthy of immediate correction through release via the habeas corpus writ. So my earlier socio-legal research argues that immigration detention is plagued by a series of procedural and natural justice failings. In detention, apart from it being incarceration on non-criminal charges, <laughs> seemingly trivial things can snowball to handicap access to justice. So there may be monthly reviews, but things like time, evidence, and prohibitive release conditions can interact to diminish the efficacy. Likewise, in these larger papers, I trace how the Harper government, who seems to be the specter of these presentations, uh, bolstered certain racialized and gendered prejudices to prop up what we consider long debunked connections that link migrants with criminality. The same government that passed into the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act Section 7, the Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Practices Act, this, that made polygamous marriage grounds for inadmissibility, also reduced the time of the Bach, mm -hmm. <laughs> and introduced into IRPA such low points as the Balanced Refugee Reform Act, C11, the Protecting Canada's Immigration System Act, C31, and the Faster Removal of Foreign Criminals Act, C43. I argue that detention and who is detainable are premised on discriminatory and racialized notions such as who is a flight risk, who can be a surety, so a surety is someone who puts up money to secure release from detention, which countries of origin are safe to return detainees to, what parents will do for their children, whether they'll abscond or whether they'll cooperate in order to secure better lives, and so on. And so in this global era of immigrant penality, liberal states are framing refugee claimants like Mr. Scotland, not as humanitarian actors, but as potential security threats. In this way, custodial immigration detention is a spectacular manifestation of the securitization of migration and refugee law. Further, I would argue that predominant neoliberal ideological filters mean that economic class immigrants are pitted into a zero-sum model or a binary against most other would-be newcomers, especially those arriving on humanitarian grounds for access to welfare resources which are pitted as scarce. So that's my other project. In this short presentation, um, I'd like to focus on the legality of the release process from detention and my argument that the renewal of habeas corpus cannot fix what is truly a broken detention system in Ontario, let alone across Canada. First, I think Mr. Scotland's case demonstrates how Canadian immigration detention can be faulted for failing to provide access to safeguards to protect the basic human rights of its population. Likewise, the case highlights failures of the immigration detention, of the immigration division's detention hearing system as being successful on paper, but fruitless in practice. A key reason for the inability of these hearings to produce meaningful change is that they are based on the detainee presenting new evidence. This is a flip from the criminal justice context where the onus remains on the state. Another reason is the very judicially worrying pattern of the Immigration Division uncritically accepting the CBSA's determinations. Mr. Scotland's case is also instructive for pointing out a violation of one of the most essential principles of justice, namely that the statutorily designed decision maker must actually make the, de the decision at issue. So in detention, there are no police or watchdog groups, there is no public reporting mechanism, and there's a worryingly high degree of opaqueness. In this context, it is not surprising that the CBSA has an outsized influence on detention decision making. 
Further, while the federal court has jurisdiction over immigration, Scotland was decided in a provincial court. And these courts often find their roles as guardians in the criminal justice setting. As such, the potential for radical overhaul of the Canadian adherence to the criminalization of migration paradigm is more possible, but also more limited at the level of provincial courts. And one final note is that I would argue against the very characterization of Scotland as exception. I think that this was a misstep in the decision, and I think that when Justice Morgan granted the writ, and he characterized the incarceration as an anomalous occurrence outside the regular state of play, for instance, I mentioned how he described it as Kafkaesque, a catch-22, this, um, this thing that was not um, gen generic to the system and therefore could be corrected immediately through a successful habeas corpus claim. I argue against this characterization and the implications it has for understanding detention in Canadian society. Mr. Scotland's treatment is not exceptional. It is not an aberration in an otherwise functioning detention system. Rather, his unjust treatment should be read as part and parcel of the criminalizing, racialized, and gender logic that was legislated by the Harper government through statutes such as the aforementioned S7 or C43. Without proper contextualization, it may be difficult to make sense of the level of prejudicial treatment endured by Mr. Scotland. The relationship of his prejudicial treatment to the Harper government's legal and legislative reforms, however, also indicates the circular nature of racialized biases in policy making. These biases not only inform and enhance each other, but it is challenging to tease out whether institutional racism was the catalyst or the result of the Harper government racialized policy making, especially when it comes to immigration and refugee issues, and on a serious note as detention. So I argue that it is questionable whether justice can ever be achieved for immigration detainees in Canada without radical overhaul, if not elimination of the status quo. The point here, I think, is to distinguish between the release of Mr. Scotland and justice for him, current detainees, and potential future detainees. What does it mean for a just resolution to leave in place an unfair, biased, and unequal system of incarceration to arrest and imprison other predominantly racialized, class, and gender people? One word. Further, certifying Mr. Scotland's writ of habeas corpus does not reconcile the fact that he was not given the benefit of the doubt at any point in his proceedings. Um, the research demonstrates that people do wish to live in the open. They do not wish to abscond, particularly people with children. Mr. Scotland was a single father to a daughter. Yet, in the typical like, criminalization of immigration switch of refiguring the onus, Mr. Scotland was time and again presumed to be a flight risk without any evidentiary proof. And this criminalizing prejudice infused itself into the Immigration Division and into the Canada Border Services Agency, and that means that he was marked and targeted for incarceration. But Justice Morgan does not name this prejudice in his decision whatsoever. So to conclude, uh, releasing Mr. Scotland on habeas corpus writ was absolutely the right thing to do, but it does not right the wrongs that were done to him. It does not resolve his refugee claim, it does not offer him restitution, and it does not accelerate his right to stay in Canada. Even more troublingly, perhaps, habeas corpus does not even correct the injustices inherent to the detention system. Without massive reform, it is inevitable that individual and systemic injustices will occur again. Therefore, I think Scotland is such an interesting case because it reveals that the myopia of the Canadian legal approach to detention and the immigration and adjudication process in which it is nested. And that individual, case-driven, problem-solving cannot be sufficient in a system that is stacked against the individual and which what we consider trite laws, the value of liberty, due process, and fairness are at stake. 